Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where we have just six rounds to figure out how the first degree could possibly be connected to the last while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. Today we were spiraling from winter solstice to Napoleon. Napoleon Dynamite? No, Bonaparte. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I chose winter solstice because it's December and the solstice is in December. Well, <laughs> in the Northern Hemisphere, it's in December. We'll get into that. But it seemed pretty appropriate because it's pretty cool. It's got all these pagan ritual around it and it's really neat. What do you think about our beginning and ending degrees, Rosanna? Well, I'm interested in the winter solstice. I don't know very much about it. And all I know about Napoleon, really, besides that he was like a guy that fought in wars, was that everybody thinks he's short, but he was actually average height. Interesting information. We'll find out if that's true or not later in this episode. Stay tuned. (laughs) (laughs) The winter solstice is also known as midwinter. It's an astronomical phenomenon. It marks the day that has the shortest amount of daylight and the longest night of the year. Napoleon was a French statesman and military leader, and he rose to prominence during the French Revolution. And he was potentially of average height. (laughs) We'll see. Rosanna, do you see anything that Napoleon and the winter solstice have in common? I mean, based on that little bit of information, no. I don't think you even said any of the same words in those two descriptions. (laughs) I said the at least four times. Maybe, uh, I mean, I know I keep going back to it, but I think this might have something to do with, like, a location. Like, they're locationally connected. Always with the locationally. Listeners, (laughs) I just want to make sure that you know that I know that is not a word. (laughs) I'm trying, I'm trying to make locationally happen. (laughs) If doppelgangery isn't going to happen, locationally, it's not going to happen. Oh, darn it. Round one. Let's learn more about winter solstice. Okay. As I said, it's the shortest day of the year. It happens twice yearly, once in each hemisphere. In the northern hemisphere, it happens in December. In the southern hemisphere, it happens in June. And that is because it when... A specific one of Earth's poles, either the North or the South Pole, is at its maximum tilt away from the sun. So if you can imagine kind of turning the Earth away from the sun, you can see how it would get more sun on one hemisphere than the other. Mm -hmm. That is why Christmas is in the middle of summer in Australia, which is a fact that I didn't know till I was like 25. What? I feel like I should have known that sooner. I also feel like you should have known that sooner. I just never did. I blame the educational system in the United States. No, actually, I blame the U.S. military because we moved so much when we were kids (laughs) that I think that I missed, like, really important lessons because they had not taught it yet. Uh. When I was at one school, when I was at the next school, they had already taught it. So I feel like I'm missing some really key information, and I just don't know what it is. I feel like everybody in the Southern Hemisphere knows that Mm -hmm. Christmas is in the winter for us because America's, you know, pop culture is just like spewed, you know, from one pole to another. Yeah. And so they see snow. And so I think it makes sense to them, you know, Mm -hmm. they have cold Christmas. We have warm Christmas. Like in New Zealand, shout out to Jocelyn and Ellen. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Merry warm Christmas. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't think I would like that at all, actually. <laughs> I think that's just because that's abnormal to you. But to them, that's totally normal. Actually, you know what? My birthday is at the end of June, and I really hate oh. the summer. So mm-hmm. if I could celebrate my birthday in the Southern Hemisphere, it would be perfect. Jaslyn and Ellen, if you'd like to host us for Rosanna's birthday in June... <laughs> Next year, we'll be there. We're totally in. Yeah. (laughs) 
and we can record a Lady Pod Squad crossover episode with high expectations. Mm-hmm. I love it. <laughs> Back to the winter solstice. As you might expect, there have been a lot of interpretations used of the event, like some sort of gods involved in the solstice and things like that. A lot of pagan rituals around uh, rebirth, holidays, festivals, gatherings. An interesting fact about cultural traditions, the pagan Scandinavian and Germanic people in Northern Europe, they celebrated this 12-day midwinter holiday called Yule, which is where we got hmm, the Christmas tree, the Christmas wreath, the Yule log, and the word Yuletide. That's where it all came from, which is all integrated into a Christian Christmas. Mm-hmm. And in Rome, ancient Rome, there was Sol Invictus, which was a Syrian god, later adopted as the chief god of the Roman Empire. His holiday is traditionally celebrated on December 25th. So later, it was again integrated into the Christian faith. I feel like the Christians not stole holidays, but like uh, swallowed the holidays. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because they wanted people to still have their celebrations and feel like they weren't missing out on things. So they made mm -hmm. up, which is exactly what the Romans did. Christians were just like the Romans in that borrowing from previous religions. <laughs> Round two. Rosanna, what is the next degree between the winter solstice and Napoleon Bonaparte? Nothing in that section sounded like it had anything to do with Napoleon. Fair. So... I mean, it's tough because we're still so many degrees away. Yeah. In the spirit of the holiday season, my guess is Yule. Your guess of Yule is incorrect. The next degree is ritual. Oh, no. That was not at all on my radar. <laughs> all right. Tell me about ritual. A ritual is a sequence of activities that involve gestures, words, objects, uh, performed in a specific place or according to a certain sequence. The word ritual really encompasses a bunch of stuff. It's pretty broad. It really is. It's not just things like worship rites and sacraments from religions and cults. Also includes rites of passage, purification rituals. Oaths of allegiance, dedication ceremonies, coronations, presidential inaugurations. I can go on forever. And there are really a lot. Or even common things like shaking hands or saying hello can be called rituals. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. There are some characteristics of something, even though there aren't really limits to the kinds of actions that can be called a ritual, they usually include a special gesture words, or recitation of a specific phrase, um, performing certain music or songs and dances. I mean, there's this huge list. Eating certain foods, drinking certain drinks, wearing certain clothes. <laughs> Reading this, I just couldn't stop thinking about the stereotype about athletes wearing like the same socks all season or something oh, as they're looking yeah. at the socks kind of thing. That's a ritual. There are quite a few categories of rituals that, that encompass different types. You've got rites of passage, like I mentioned. Um, a person's transition from one status to another, it's the marking of that. Like birth, coming of age, marriage, death. You've got a calendrical and commemorative rites, which is marking particular times of year, like the winter solstice. Rites of exchange and communion, which includes sacrifices and offerings that are meant basically to placate divine powers. So also rites of affliction, which are actions that try to stop spirits from causing misfortune with humans. Political rit rituals, like the divine right of European kings, or even um, swearing on a Bible in a courtroom. And my very favorite, rites of feasting, fasting, and festivals. And that's when a whole community publicly adheres to basic shared religious values. They have feasts, festivals, parades, things like that. There was one anthropologist that described it as social drama, which I thought was good. <laughs> <laughs> 
Round three. Rosanna, what is the next degree yes. between ritual and Napoleon? Okay. Napoleon was a politician ish, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go with political rituals. Oh, okay. Your guess of political rituals is incorrect, but on the right track. The next degree is oath of allegiance. Oh. Yeah. Which sounds very specific. Yeah. An oath of allegiance is when a subject or a citizen acknowledges their duty or allegiance, and they swear loyalty to a monarch or a country. So, political, yes. In republics, modern oaths are usually to a country or a country's constitution. Mm -hmm. Like in the U.S., if you don't know, which is a republic, taking an oath of office includes swearing allegiance to the U.S. Constitution. And also the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. In a constitutional monarchy like the U.K. or Australia, oaths usually sworn to the monarch. And armed forces usually require an oath as well. In feudal times, people would swear allegiance to their feudal superiors, which is just like the nobles, basically. Mm -hmm. Interesting fact. To this day, the free men of the city of London have to swear an oath of obedience to the Lord Mayor of the city of London. The who has to? Free men of the city of London. Free men, because apparently they didn't used to be free. I'm not quite sure. Why the word free man was used there. Yeah, it's, it's weird to me you have to use the word free. I think that that used to be a feudal thing. Oh. So. Uh, but they still have to do it. Apparently. <laughs> okay. I don't. I don't live in the city of London. So, you know, there's that. That's true. Another interesting fact about oaths of allegiance. There have been moves in some of the realms, like the UK realm, where it has Australia, New Zealand, and all that under its power, there have been moves to make the oath of citizenship sworn by the citizens refer to the country instead of the monarch, so not Elizabeth. Ah. Uh. But they haven't actually changed these. The main reason it seemed that these moves haven't succeeded is because the queen is the personification of the country. Round four. Rosanna, what is the next degree between Oath of Allegiance and Napoleon Bonaparte? I wrote down a couple things. Amazing you got that much out of such a short degree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back and forth between monarch and loyalty. Oh, okay. And I think those both could be applied to Napoleon in, in some way. So I think I'm going to land on loyalty. That's my guess. Your guess of loyalty is incorrect, but slightly related to the right degree, maybe. The next degree is feudalism. Feudalism is a combination of legal and military customs. It's from medieval Europe, mainly happened between the 9th and 15th centuries. Generally, it was how they structured society around relationships that were somebody held land Somebody did a service or labor on that land. It was centered around lords, vassals, and fiefs. So the lord owned a fief, which was a land, and the vassals were pledged to the lord and worked that land. Okay. And they lived on the land. In the earlier cases, they, well, they lived there for free. In some cases, they were taxed. But in the beginning, they lived there for free because they promised that in exchange for living on that land... For free, they would fight for the Lord when needed. Ah. This was mainly because a kingdom couldn't keep a standing army. It was just too expensive. Right. And so they had all these separated little fiefs or fiefdoms. And so there were kind of three estates of the realm. You had the nobility, the clergy, and the peasantry, all bound by what's called manorialism, which is just everything centered around a manor. So you've got a manor in the country, and everybody is somehow associated with it. I feel like this kind of stuff comes up a lot in historical fiction based on fact, you know? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're just constantly seeing, you know, the head guy in the area 
and you have to swear your allegiance to him and you live under his protection, but you have to fight for him when he calls you. That happens tons. Game of Thrones is a perfect example of feudalism. Yeah. How society is structured there. And the reason it emerged in the first place was because empires were decentralized. They had mounted soldiers and they wanted to start using a system of hereditary rule over land. But they couldn't really do that if they didn't have established fiefs. Right. And so they were able to reward soldiers with land that they then became lords of. Interesting fact, feudalism effectively ended about 1500. It was partly because the military shifted from armies made up of nobility and their vassals to professional fighters. And so the nobility didn't quite have as much claim on power anymore. And Mm -hmm. also because the Black Death reduced the nobility's hold over the lower classes. Yikes. Yeah. That reduced a lot of everything. It really, really did. Another interesting fact. In 1974, there was a U.S. historian named Elizabeth A.R. Brown. And she actually said the label of feudalism was an anachronism, which means kind of out of time. And it gave a false sense of uniformity to the whole concept of how society was structured. So the definitions of feudalism are are pretty varied across time, and it's actually kind of going out of style to use that term, because they're not really sure that's how it was really structured. Oh. Yeah, there are debates about it. She and many others say that there's no basis in medieval reality for feudalism. It was more a tyrannical government that told you you had to go do this stuff and taxed you. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Round five. Rosanna, what is the next degree between feudalism and Napoleon? What could it be? I actually wrote down a ton of stuff, hoping that at some point it would connect to something else. (laughs) Um, And it would become obvious. Kind of not so much. So does it ever become obvious? (sighs) I don't. I don't think it ever does. And when it does, it's always wrong. It's always a trick. Yeah. Like, the next degree could be feudalism because there's a movie called Feudalism or something. Hey, no, 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 no. I don't make tricks like that. You make tricks like that. (laughs) I am not that much of a sadist. I... It's fun. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. So, I feel like... This has to veer towards the military. Okay. Um, if we're going to get to Napoleon. So. Makes sense. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to say, I can't just say the military, right? Well, you could. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to guess military customs. Okay. Your guess of military customs is incorrect. Way incorrect. Like, super duper incorrect. <laughs> so, so not military then. Okay. No. Were any of the letters the same? <laughs> yes. It started with the same letter. Oh. Uh, manner? Is it manner? The next degree is manorialism. What? I don't even know what that is. Did you say that? I defined it. In my description of the degree. What? It's the organizing principle of a rural economy organized around a manor. Oh, so manor isn't... I see now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it's kind of similar to feudalism uh, with some specific differences. So, it's, it's people organized around a manor, which makes you think, you know, organized around a lord and his castle or whatever he's got. And so it's the lord of the manor. But the biggest difference is that people don't live there for free and they're not expected to just go fight as payment for living there. Oh, okay. So people were a little bit freer, but they could also be kicked off more easily if things didn't go so well for them. (laughs) If they had a bad harvest kind of thing, you know. So basically, people paid to use the land instead of just. Promising to fight when called. Now, this was not a very long article, so I don't have much left except how it was abolished. 
Oh. Which was different in different places. So the last feudal dues or fees to live there in France were abolished in the French Revolution. In parts of eastern Germany, the uh, Rittergut, I don't know how to pronounce that in German, <laughs> that manners in Rittergut <laughs> remained until <laughs> World War II, which it seems pretty late. That's kind of recent, actually, relatively. Oh, just wait. In Quebec, the last feudal rents were paid in what year, do you think? <sighs> well, I'm guessing more recent than World War II. Uh, 1964. 1970. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Not really that long ago. That's wild. Round six. Rosanna, what is the next degree between manorialism and Napoleon? I'm pretty sure I'm going to bring it back around with this one. Okay. My guess is the French Revolution. Your guess of the French Revolution is correct. Woo! <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have mentioned it when I was talking about him in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like if I hadn't gotten that one, I might as well just quit this whole entire yeah. project. Uh, well, because that, that was pretty important. Nobody to wants to hear that history. Yeah. A, li- a little bit. Yeah. All right, let's hear about the French Revolution. So this is the part of the episode when we really get into all the good stuff. Because the French Revolution and Napoleon, oh man, so much. So much. So the French Revolution was from 1789 to 1799, about ten and a half years long. It was a period of really far-reaching social and political upheaval in France. And when I say far-reaching, I don't mean just geographically or locationally. I mean through time. (laughs) This had a huge, huge impact on the modern era in politics. It's amazing. So the revolution overthrew the monarchy, established a republic in France, caused 10 years of violent periods of political turmoil, and finally culminated in a dictatorship under Napoleon. It triggered the global decline of absolute monarchies. Wow. Yeah. That's a pretty big uh, butterfly effect. (laughs) It really, really is. It started global conflicts that went from the Caribbean to the Middle East. It is considered by historians one of the most important events in human history. Wow. I did not know this when I... Wow. I've learned so much about history in this show. And the more I learn, the more I feel like I should have always known so much more. I did not pay enough attention in school. That's Yeah, that's a valid point. But yeah, I always figured, you know, oh, yeah, that's the whole thing with Marie Antoinette and cutting off heads of monarchs and stuff. But I had no idea it was as far reaching as it is. So the actual cause of the French Revolution, there doesn't seem to be a single one. After the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, the French government was severely in debt as many governments do to try to fix that they started taxing the people just so much so much people were way overtaxed they they didn't learn from the american revolution that people don't like to be overtaxed huh they did not and one thing that made the taxes worse is that they they came at a time after years of bad harvests so really a bad time for those taxes (laughs) and there were a ton of privileges that caused resentment among the peasantry, privileges enjoyed by the aristocracy and the Catholic clergy of the church. Oh, of course. They were fat and happy. The peasantry was starving. Thomas Jefferson said that France had been, quote, awakened by our American Revolution. Yes. Fans of Hamilton would know that too, BTW. (laughs) So I'm going to give you the biggest events that happened during those 10 years. 1789, commoners took control. The Bastille was attacked. The Declaration of Rights of Men and the Citizen was passed. And a group of women marched on Versailles, which forced the royal court to leave and go back to Paris. Oh. Feudalism was abolished. Just completely wiped out. In 1792, after the French had a victory at Valmy, Louis XIV was executed. Not too long after... Marie Antoinette was as well. In 1793, 
there was a dictatorship imposed by what was called the Committee of Public Safety during what they called the Reign of Terror. Oh. So from 1793 to 1794, they established price controls on food, abolished slavery in French colonies abroad. Oh. De-established the Catholic Church. <gasps> what? What? <laughs> they de-Christianized the French society. <laughs> created a secular Republican calendar. Ex- <laughs> expelled religious leaders. And drew new borders for the Republic. Oh my gosh. So, a lot happened in a year. A lot. Wow. Unfortunately, the next year, 1795... There was an executive council called The Directory, which sounds like a really shady governmental organization in a TV show today. The Directory, all capitalized. Yeah. They took control of the French state, which was a mess. They suspended elections, ignored debts, which caused a lot of financial instability, persecuted the Catholic clergy, and started a lot of military conquests abroad. But, as you might expect, they got really corrupt and they collapsed in a coup led by Napoleon in 1799. So they just replaced a bad system with a bad system. Yeah, that happens more often than it should, probably. <laughs> it does. It really does. The biggest effect or effects of the French Revolution, it they led to the modern era. The revolution started the suppression of the feudal system, emancipation of the individual, so abolishment of slavery, Greater division of landed property, abolition of the privileges of noble birth. So, you know, as many people know, and it's very few countries where heredity makes much of a difference as far as titles, if there are even titles left, and the establishment of equality among men. So, really, a lot of American constitutional values. Here is my interesting yet very macabre fact. Okay. The Reign of Terror that I mentioned before was called that because at least 16,594 people were killed under the guillotine. What? Or otherwise after they were accused of counter-revolutionary activities. By guillotine? Yeah. As many as 40,000 accused prisoners may have been completely executed without trial or died awaiting trial. (gasps) 40,000. Oh my gosh. So the Reign of Terror is, I think, a very logical name for that time. Very appropriate. Wow. Yeah, it was very ugly. It was a scary place to be, I think. I think it was the directory. I can't remember the exact uh, group that did it because there were multiple groups taking power. They went and basically stole harvests from the people (gasps) to keep, to bring to Paris. So people in Paris were okay. But wow. the peasants outside of Paris were starving because their food was being taken. That is horrible. Yeah, imagine starving when you had land full of food. Well, it's just like when we talked about the famine in Ireland. Yeah. They had food and it, and it was being sent away and they were starving. Yep. That's what happened. So Napoleon helped out a bunch. He lived from 1769 to 1821. He died when he was 51. And he was a pretty serious figure in history, but also pretty controversial as far as he was good or bad. Mm -hmm. He, as many other conquerors did, held many titles, including Emperor of the French, King of Italy, Protector of the Confederate of the Rhine, and First Consul of France. He was a statesman and military leader in France who rose to prominence during the French Revolution, led several successful campaigns during the French Revolutionary Wars. And he just completely dominated European and global affairs for more than 10 years, leading France through the Napoleonic Wars. Imagine having a whole set of wars named after you. That would be something. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd like that, though, (laughs) to be honest. (laughs) He won most of the wars and the majority of the battles. He built a huge empire that ruled over continental Europe before it collapsed in 1815. He's considered one of the greatest commanders in history, and they still teach his military tactics. I mean, that makes sense. He won a lot. Yeah. A little bit of history on Napoleon before he was the Napoleon we knew about. He joined the military when he was pretty young, rose rapidly through the ranks. He became a general at age 24. What? 24. 
That's crazy. Really is. He just kept winning battles. He was really, really good at being in the military. Just so good. So after he orchestrated the coup in 1799, he became the first consul of the Republic. And he had great public approval, which inspired him to go further. And he became the first emperor of the French in 1804. And he continued conquering places via battles. There was this weird little nugget in the article in this section that said he declared his brother Joseph Bonaparte the king of Spain in 1808. No context, no linked article, just, <laughs> oh yeah, he just made him a king of Spain. Like, I need more information on this. I feel like Spain might have had something to say about it. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> now, here's when he started to decline a little bit. In 1812, he launched a major invasion of Russia. And invading Russia never seems to go well for anyone. If you look at history, while the campaign did destroy some Russian cities, it resulted in a collapse of his army, his giant <gasps> army. Oh, no. And it inspired some of the countries he was fighting against to unite against him. Oh, yeah. Which was the beginning of the end. The Allies were formed. They invaded France, captured Paris in 1814, and Napoleon was forced to abdicate. Wow. But, oh, he had a comeback. He was exiled to the island of Elba off the coast of Tuscany. Oh no, how sad. I'm stuck on a beautiful island off Tuscany. How Good terrible. Grief. He escaped in 1815 and again took control of France. What? <laughs> He's like, I'm back, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Sequel. Wee oui, wee oui, baguette. Let's fight. <laughs> the Allies got together and again defeated him. This time at the Battle of Waterloo, which you've probably heard of. I have. This time he was exiled to a remote island called St. Helena. Would somebody exile me to an island, please? <laughs> that sounds really nice. I could use a little tropical vacation. He had a lot of health problems because the place he lived there was really damp and cold. Oh. So it may have helped kill him, but who knows? He died there six years later when he was 51. Yeah, that's not very old. Interesting fact... The cause of his death is not quite agreed upon. Oh. His autopsy says he died of stomach cancer, but the rumor is he was actually killed with arsenic, poisoned by someone. So here's, here's what we've got for evidence. Napoleon's body was pretty well preserved when it was moved in 1840. Arsenic is a very strong preservative, which I didn't know. That's also a really weird thing to know. That is a weird thing to know. It supported the poisoning hypothesis. There was also evidence in hair samples of really high levels of arsenic. But they had hair samples from when he was younger, even a boy. And he had very high levels of arsenic then. Like a hundred times what you what? should have. How is that possible? Because they, arsenic was used in glues and dyes. So people were exposed to it all the time. Huh. So we don't know. He could have been poisoned slowly over time if he was murdered with arsenic. But if you like wear clothes with arsenic in them on the dye, it's going to seep into your skin. Most likely. Because people wore clothes for a long time. They didn't you know, take them off at the end of the day and wash them and not wear them again for a week. <laughs> so. I mean, it kind of sounds like he built up an immunity to arsenic. <laughs> to iodine powder. Exactly. He had a little <laughs> bit every day since he was a little boy. <laughs> now, listeners, what you've all been waiting for, let's talk about Napoleon's <laughs> height. Okay. Now, Rosanna, you said you thought he was about average height. That's what I've read. That's what you've read. There are a lot of descriptions of him that... Talk about him being a small or slight man. A lot of these are from people that didn't like him. So there's that. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was probably five feet, two inches. Five feet, two? Mm-hmm. Here's, here's the thing. That is the height of an average French male in that time. Totally average for men to be five, two. 
That's very short, though. Well, it's it's short for an aristocrat or an officer because they usually had more money, better nutrition, so they ended up taller. Huh. And they weren't sucking arsenic since childhood? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> it's possible that he was actually 5'7". That's what I've heard. The controversy is that there's a difference in the French measurement of inches. Some oh. think that it, when they measured him at death, they used an obsolete old French yardstick, which oh, means it, the measurement could have been off. But really, we don't know. Here's another thing. He surrounded himself with giant bodyguards, which made him look smaller. <laughs> so while we don't really know how tall he was, he definitely wasn't shorter than average. Okay. It was unlikely he had a complex about being short. <laughs> Well, we've made it through all six degrees. We went from winter solstice to ritual to oath of allegiance to feudalism to manorialism to French Revolution to Napoleon Bonaparte. Rosanna, what did you think about this spiral? This was a very interesting spiral. Oh, I good. really did not know much about a lot of this stuff. Super cool to learn about Napoleon in the French Revolution. Super excited that I got the first one right of season two. <laughs> Congratulations. So one point for Rosanna, now that we're going to start keeping track. So, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. It was fascinating. Good. It's time for Whim of the Week. Our Whim this week is the movie Robin Hood which is pretty appropriate to some of the degrees like feudalism and manorialism. Accidentally appropriate. Yeah, accidentally. <laughs> Didn't even mean to when we picked it. It stars Taron Edgerton from the Kingsman series, Jamie Dornan from Fifty Shades of Grey, Jamie Foxx <laughs> from so many things, <laughs> Tim Minchin, the comedian, and some other people that look kind of familiar, but I don't know who they are. Rosanna and I went and saw this movie together over Thanksgiving weekend. Which was very nice because we got to spend Thanksgiving together, which we don't get to do very often. And we got to go see a movie starring an actor, Taron Edgerton, that we both really, really like. Yeah. I really like him. He's great. He's just adorable. <laughs> he is. And he was very good in this movie. Yes. The movie has not done very well in the box office. It's kind of bombed. I don't know why. It's because nobody went to see it. I think it didn't have great marketing. I only even knew about it because of Reddit. And the only reason I saw a trailer is because you sent it to me. Yeah, I think the marketing was pretty terrible. I don't think it's, it's their fault that it did not do well. Which makes me sad because that means they probably won't do a sequel. I know. And I thought it was a really good movie and I really enjoyed the time. It was very entertaining. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a really interesting and new take on Robin Hood because it really is his sort of origin story when he's much younger than we usually see him. Yeah, he really was a lot younger. My only knowledge of Robin Hood is the Kevin Costner film <laughs> from way back when with Morgan Freeman. Yeah, and usually when we see Robin Hood, he he's not been a lord for some time. Mm hmm Yeah. And in this movie, he's learning to steal, getting better with the bow and arrow, you know, that kind of thing, which everybody loves a training montage, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Who does not love a training montage? It was wonderful. And I will say, while it did have a ton of violence, I think it did it really well, and it wasn't gory. It wasn't at all. There was hardly any blood at all. Mm hmm I'm pretty sure it was rated PG-13, right? It's not even an R-rated movie. One thing I really loved about the movie was the style of archery that they had, which seemed like a new style. But according to a lot of videos I have watched on the YouTube, it, <laughs> it's a really ancient style of archery that was actually used a lot faster and better in combat situations. I saw some training videos of Taron Edgerton doing the actual stunts he did in the movie, you know, jumping off of something and shooting two arrows while he was in the air. He wow. really did it. That's it was really amazing. amazing. And so it was neat to incorporate that kind of historical accuracy in a movie that was obviously very fictional. And then on top of that, with the historical accuracy of that part, then we also got definitely some modern vibes. 
Um, oh, yeah. Some of the clothing, mm-hmm. the war scene where Robin has to go and fight for the country felt very like Gulf War, kind of. Mm-hmm. And the language was very modern, too. Yeah, it was really cool and interesting. Yeah, I thought it was a really great take. It was a much cooler version of Robin Hood than the Kevin Costner, for sure. I would absolutely recommend it to anybody. I really want everyone to go see it like four times. Or if you're listening to this after it's out of theaters, stream it a bunch so they make a sequel because I really want to see a sequel. Please. Yes. I want a sequel (laughs) too. Today, we also have a new review to read. This review comes from Courtney, one of the hosts of the Spoop Hour podcast. Five stars for all trivia lovers. If you've ever fallen down a rabbit hole on Wiki, this podcast is for you. Each episode sees Rosanna and Nikki traversing from one end of Wikipedia to the other. It's part fun facts, guessing game, all entertaining. Episodes are a bit on the shorter side while still sharing great information, so they're perfect for a quick errand or quiet moments at home. That's such a nice review. Thank you, Courtney. I'm a regular listener of Spoop Hour. I listen to their episodes as soon as they're released because listening to Courtney and Sasha talk about just anything that's kind of like weird, paranormal, spooky, scary, legends, myths. It's just a lot of fun. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. Keep up with us at sixdegreesofwiki.com and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to let us know what you think. Looking for early access to episodes and bonus content like bloopers? Go to patreon.com to become a Six Degrees of Wiki patron and get discounts on merch or even help us choose degrees. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.